Dr. Dick Foth is, uh, has been a, a pastor, uh, a college president, a coach to ambassadors and senators and people of influence, and has had an enormous impact around the world. But that is not why he is here today. Um, I was never part of his congregation, and I was never a student at the college where he was a president, and I am certainly neither powerful nor influential. But it's because of his role in my life, being a friend to me since I was a young man, way too young, I think, to, be, to deserve to be taken seriously at the time. It's because of that role in my life that he's here. He and his wife of almost 60 years, Ruth, have been a consistent presence in my life. They have invited me into their home. They've invited me into their world and into their walk with Jesus. And uh, so I'll say this, Foth is our guest today because from the time that I was 19 years old until now, through so many changes, through so many joys and significant losses, Foth has been a spiritual father, a source of encouragement and counsel to me. Uh, he was there when Jesse and I began our journey together. I don't know if we have that right there. He was the one who performed our wedding ceremony um, and, and was there at the beginning for us of our family together. And he's been a blessing to New City Church even now by the, this series that we're going through, uh, the videos that he's prepared uh, called Till Kingdom Come. So what I would say is to add to his, to his CV, um, in addition to all the things that I mentioned, at the top of the list, I would put this very prestigious title of friend. Like most true friends, you can't waste your time wondering why in the world are they my friend, <laughs> though I'm tempted to wonder that. Instead, you should just thank God for that friendship and, and lean into the blessing that it brings into your life. And so I am so grateful that he is a friend, so grateful that you would take the time to be here. Dick, we love you and we welcome you. Let's welcome Dr. Dick Foth, New City Church. try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. There you are. I have imagined you in my mind. I don't know that I've imagined that far up. I didn't realize it went that far up. There are people up there. I told folks yesterday that I've just finished my 81st trip around the sun. One of the things when you get this old or mature that you say sometimes is, oh, to be a kid again. I understand that you have a second childhood. That, that's what I've heard. Now, I don't want to go back through the teen years. I don't do that. I just want to go to the second childhood. I understand you lose your social inhibitions. I am so excited about that possibility. So, but I want to talk about that today. I, I want to talk about what it means to be a kid again today and you know how this birth thing works you have conceptions and conception and cells start dividing and organs form and systems are shaped and so and you're so connected to the mother's body and you're protected for nine months and then the pressure starts and in your I don't remember this part but I'm thinking uh, this doesn't seem like it's going to be good and then you have that birth thing happen and the pain and the risk is both the mothers and the child and you're born and you're upside down and there are giants and lights and they're speaking funny languages and you're saying, don't hit me, I'll cry. You know, whatever it is that happens when babies are born. But here we are and we're all new and we're so cute and you don't have social inhibitors and, and you say funny things. We have four kids. Now they're all in their 50s. And we have 12 grandkids from age 32 to age 7. And we have uh, three great-grandchildren and two more on the way. But when Jenny, who is now in her mid-50s, was, uh, I don't know what she was, four years old or something, Erica, her older sister, had learned to read. And kids just say funny stuff. And so we're sitting at the table, and Erica liked to ask for things by spelling it. Please pass the B-R-E-A-D. And... One night, Jenny said, uh, after she had done that, Jenny said, could you please pass me the S-U-I-I? -I? 
I said, I, I'd be pleased to, Jenny, but w like, what is that? And she looked at me like I had a third eye in the middle of my forehead and said, well, I don't know, I can't read. So, you know, kids just say funny stuff. And here, Jesus, the one we call Messiah, the one we worship as king of the universe, knew about childhood. He had a challenging childhood, had a road trip in his mother's womb. He was born in a barn virtually, or not virtually, literally. He was a refugee in Egypt with his family for two years. When he's 12 years and he's going to temple for Passover, his parents lose him for Pete's sake, like for three days. He knows about childhood. But the thing about that children have is perspective. They just see things in different ways, don't they? Um, Allison, our granddaughter who's 32 and now has two of her own and a third coming. We were visiting with her out in California with her folks and she's about three at the time and early in the morning, like 5.30, she crawls up in bed with us. Now, if you're parents of, of little ones, you're saying, oh no, here they are again. And, and they're usually wet. And so she, she crawled up in bed with us and she said, Let's talk. And I'm clawing my way up out of the darkness because it's cool. If you're a grandparent, it's cool when the grandkids climb up. Yeah. And I just said, uh, what do you want to talk about? She said, I'm going to have a baby sister. I said, well, it could be a brother. She said, yeah, but I want a sister. I said, well, let's think of some names. She said, okay. I said, why don't we call the baby Boogalooney? She looked at me. I said, how about Zonga Bonga Wonga? She started to laugh. I said, why don't we call the baby Yabaslavovich? And she just howled and said, oh, Grandpa, those are boy names. <laughs> I didn't know. And, and if you think little kids think in a different framework, you ought to try Jesus. I love what Dorothy Sayers, the British mystery writer, said years ago when she said, the people who crucified the Christ... To do them justice did not do so because he was a bore. Quite the contrary, he was too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. One of the prayers of my 81-year-old life is, God, don't let me muffle up your shattering personality and surround you with an atmosphere of tedium. We have enough stuff in our lives to bore us. We don't want you to be one of those because we put you in a corner or whatever it is. He's the king of the kingdom of God. If you're reading Matthew, he's, it's the kingdom of heaven because it's a Jewish audience and they wouldn't write God out. But this king of the kingdom is present, available, and totally different. So I want to talk to you about being a kid in the kingdom with that as a context. So Jesus describes the kingdom as the rule of God and he uses images. You read the gospels and he paints pictures, you know, word pictures. He has stories of lost sheep and wayward sons and, or he points out objects. He talks about a field or a vineyard or an orchard, whatever it is. But the first century listeners knew about kings and kingdoms. We don't know about kings and kingdoms. We, I mean, our whole country was based on the fact that we didn't want a king. That's the point of having separation of powers. So if I take you to D.C. with me, you see the executive branch when you pass the White House. You drive up a little further and you see the legislative branch, the people's house, and you look behind that and there's the, the law branch, right, the, 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 the Supreme Court. We separated the power so you can't do it like a king does it. But the problem is I love democracy. I like voting and all that kind of stuff. But I'm designed for a king. I'm built for a king. And when we read the Gospels, you have this. And so here's the scenario very quickly. It's two weeks before the crucifixion. About now, actually, this time of year. And here's my air map. And I told folks, <laughs> I said, Ruth, when I, whenever I do this with Ruth, she says, Dick, I cannot see that. How you're, she's very literal and she, I can't, but here, here's the map. This is the Middle East. Here's the Mediterranean. You got, down here you got Egypt and North Africa. Over here you've got Turkey and Italy and Greece, all that. But here you have what is now Israel, Palestine, Syria in Jesus' day. And up here you have the Sea of Galilee and down here comes the Jordan River and there's the Dead Sea. And over here is Jerusalem. And as you come down the Jordan River Valley, you come to this town of Jericho. 
800 feet below sea level. And then it's the lowest, eight, lowest and longest inhabited city in the world, according to most archaeologists. And you take a 45 and you start climbing up to 2,500 feet over 17 or 18 miles and you get to Jerusalem. Jesus is coming in to Jericho. He's approaching Jericho. And this is two weeks before the crucifixion, two months before he goes back to the Father. And the word is out. The Holy One from Nazareth is coming. He's a deep teacher. He has authority over evil. He heals. He raises the dead. People are excited, apparently. And a bunch of stuff happens. And you can read this. I'm not going to read the text. You can read this in Matthew 18 and Mark 10 and Luke 19. There are people in that context who want things from him. He's on his way to the cross. And a mother of two of the disciples wants the special seats for her boys, right? A rich young ruler wants eternal life. A blind guy by the name of Bartimaeus wants to see. And Zacchaeus, who's a ripoff artist of Jericho, he's the tax collector. He's a short guy and he wants to see better, so he climbs a tree. You know that story, The things that he says, he says to the rich guy who wants eternal life, go and sell all you have. He says to the other rich guy, Zacchaeus, who got his money from you and other guys, he says, "Uh, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go to your house. So he heals blind Bartimaeus so he can see, and he heals Zacchaeus in a different way. That's who he is. But the difference between God's kingdom that they're experiencing at Jericho is very different than the kingdom of the Caesars who are in control at the time. I mean, in the kingdom of God, the poor are valued, the outcasts are recruited, the rip-off guys are engaged, the worn traditions are appended, old practices are challenged, and apparently categories are obliterated. What would happen if we lived without categories? What would happen if we stopped saying, oh, you know how they are, that group, or that side of town, or those people over there? Here's the God who loves eight billion people individually. He does not see you as a group. He's not up there saying, I don't know what I'm gonna do with those new city people. You know, he's, he's not saying that, right? But that's where little children come in, okay? Can you see it? Here's Jesus. If I'm a 10-year-old and Jesus is lengthening arms and raising people from the dead and he's calling, not calling out, but calling down the guy who everybody hates in town and goes to his house for lunch for Pete's sake, if I'm a 10-year-old, I'm all over that. I mean, you've got all kinds of kids who are following him. And when you get to Mark 10th chapter, this is how it reads. People were bringing little children, and the word there is a Greek word, paideia, from which we get pediatrics, okay? Bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked him. Why would they do that? Well, in that culture, women and children didn't count. Women were chattel property back in the day. And kids, you know, they just didn't, they, they're underfoot. They're in the way. When Jesus saw this, He was indignant. I love this. If you want to make God mad, try to keep little kids away from him. He was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He's saying, these are the shareholders, right? This is the stock exchange. These are the people who hold shares in the kingdom. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. In Luke 18, and you have this in all three, you have it in Matthew as well. People were also bringing babies, different word, and it means baby or even child in the womb. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to Can you see him kneeling down, picking up this four-year-old? Yeah. And saying, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I love the way Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase of Mark and the message says it. This is how he says it. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of the life in the kingdom. 
Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you will never get in. Then gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands on them, blessing them. His hands of blessing on them, excuse me. So try to get your head around this. In that culture, for an adult to become like a child is mind-boggling. They love age, they love wisdom, they love experience. And to think of entering God's kingdom by reverting to childhood is unthinkable. So what are the qualities of a child at play here? Like, what are they? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's humility. They, they, got, they got nothing, right? So they're, they're humble just by definition, right? But they're the least. So whatever become like a child means, it means to understand that you're the least, but you get in. That's why you get in, because you don't have your stuff in the way, and you get in. You're approaching it that way. I'm thinking about our own kids, those four kids I told about that are all in their 50s now. When Eric, our oldest, who's now a mother of four and a grandmother of three, when, when she was 10, we were driving across town in Urbana, Illinois, because we were doing a church plant near the University of Illinois back in the late 60s into the late 70s. And um, I said, Erica, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's a good dad question. That's what you ask a 10-year-old. What do you want to be when you grow up? And she looked at me and grinned and said, I don't know, Dad. What do you want to be? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a smart mouth. You know, what do we do? Maybe it's the directness that Jesus is talking about. Maybe that's what he's looking for. How about... Um, what about being impetuous? Kids are impetuous. They just do stuff. They don't think of... <clears throat> I had a season when I played tennis. You older guys, you know, you go through your tennis season and your running season and your jogging season. And, your, and um, I had been not playing tennis. I came in and we had a split level house in Urbana and I turned to put my tennis racket down on the car. I'm sweating and stuff. And I hear a voice of a three-year-old Jenny say, catch me, daddy. And she was on the top stair, and I turned, and she had launched. She came flying, and I grabbed her like this, and I said, Jenny, don't do that. I could drop you. And she just put her face up against my sweaty face, whispered in my ear, and said, oh, no, you're my daddy. And I'm going, what? I guess. And, uh... Or Chris, when he was four, he... He's now CEO of a multi-million dollar company, but he was four. He walked and said, Dad, help me with my numbers. He's learning to count. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to count to 10. I said, okay, what's two plus three? And he looked at his hands because he had 10 digits. Said, it's five. I said, what's five plus two? He looked at his hands and said, seven. I said, nine plus one, you know, 10. I said, what's 10 plus two? He looked at his hands. I said, I can't tell you that. I said, how come? He said, because I'd have to have 12 fingers to tell you that. <laughs> he didn't know. He's always learning. Maybe it's that kids are always learning and they don't know they're learning. Maybe that's it. Or one of my favorites is Susanna, who was our wild child, not in a bad sense, but boy, I mean, you let her go for a nanosecond and she's three blocks down. I mean, some of you have children like that. Some of you were children like that. And so don't complain. And so she was, she was just like that. And now she has three adult male boy, you know, men that she's the mother of. And uh, I walked in one day, and she's probably six or seven, and she's lying by the washing machine on the linoleum. And I said, Suze, what are you doing? She said, nothing, which, of course, is a dead giveaway. I said, stand up, Susanna. She stood up. And when she stood up, out from under her shirt up here, came the head of a little white kitten. And we have, had a rule at our house, no cat. Some of you are, are cat lovers, and please, this is not Bible, what I'm telling you now. I'm, I'm sort of a dog guy. And, and, you know, because dogs know your master, and cats think your staff. And so <laughs> here's this little head sticking out from under. And I said, Susanna, you know the rule. No cats. See, mom had been complicit. They came out of Safeway. Somebody's giving away these cute little kitties, and mom's sort of into cats, and so here she ends up with this little cat. I said, you know the rule, no cat. And she looks at me with this big brown, these big brown eyes, and she says, he was a stranger, and I took him in. <laughs> Don't you hate it when they quote scripture like that? That's a, you know, that. We kept the cat, we called it Nanook of the North, and there you go. That's how that, that worked. The thing about 
the core experience, though, these are little people. These are people he can take in his arms. These aren't 10-year-olds, probably. These are like two, three, four-year-olds. What is it about that? Well, for a toddler or a little person, the early years are an ongoing delight of firsts. Everything is a first. What would it be like to have a heart because I'm moving? Because the little kids always moved. I was out there before service. You got a lot of little people. I mean, they were doing cartwheels across. The, they, were, they were scrambling people, chasing them because they move. You say, how can somebody move that fast on short legs? Like a two-year-old is faster than the speed of light. They, they're gone. So they're always moving and everything is a first for them. And at, but the, at the heart of it for a child is trust. What little children do, what babies do, it's complete, it's reflexive, it's unabashed. I have a friend, we're in a small group with a, a young woman, well, young to me, she's not young, she's a grandmother, but she's in her 60s now. And, and um, I knew, I met her when she was a high schooler in Urbana. She used to, with some girlfriends, come over to church on Sunday night when we had those services. And years later, 50 years later, or 40 years later, I walk into this congregation in Fort Collins, Colorado, where we live, and she walks up and says, I don't know if you remember me, my name was Barbara Unteed, and it's a high school girl who's now married to the head of the Nutritional Science Department at Colorado State University, and she herself is a grandmother. We're in a little group together, and she's early childhood teacher for 30 years. And this is what she says, children are eager to learn they do that by experience. Hands-on is their way. Once they trust, they jump in with enthusiasm. Trust is the key word. The trust of a child drives everything else. They never tire of what they love to do. And here's the king of the universe says, my kingdom is comprised of those kind of people, that kind of person, right? I love G.K. Chesterton, who's the... He would be called today a thought leader, an author and a writer from the last century, contemporary of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and some of these guys. I love what he says about children. This is what he says. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. How many of you have, you have read a, a bedtime story to a little kid and they want to hear it the next night and they want to hear it? And if you leave out a word, they get you, right? They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately because he's never got tired of making them. I love this part. Here's the clincher. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy for we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we I'm going to say that again it may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy but we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we so what is it about a baby he says be a baby you know that's one of the words that's used be a baby well, a child in arms, that's ultimate trust, absolute dependence. That's what he's looking for. Not partial dependence, not 30%, not 10%. Babies can't do anything for themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't change themselves. They can't walk. You've got to carry them and all that. But it puts me in tension. I've got to confess to this. It puts me in tension because I've been taught to, to grow in Christ, to be mature, to grow, I, I, I can remember being a 10-year-old and doing some dumb stuff because that's what we do when we're 10. We, I mean, we're just, we're experimenting. We're, you know, checking the limits. We're doing all this, and it's fun, and so we're doing whatever it is, and some grown-up will say, oh, Dick, grow up. So I've worked like crazy to grow up, 
and now I'm eight times 10, and the God of the universe says, oh, Dick, be a child. What do I do with that? What do I do with the tension between grow up and be mature in Christ and be a baby? This is what I've come to. If I am a child with God, if I absolutely trust God, I can be an adult with you. You can take my word to the bank. You can count on me to be responsible. You can count on me to follow through. You can count on me not to shoot off my mouth the first time I hear something, but to listen and to ponder and to give it time to soak in. You can, and I don't always do that. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm just saying that I think helps me with the tension. Here's the God who calls me to be a child, absolutely depend on him. And on the other hand, he's calling me to be mature when I'm working in civil society and working with my family and all of that. So I'm done, except for one story. Our daughter Jenny, the one who leapt off the top stair and said, yes, but you're my daddy, that one, always had a heart for missions. And so when she was in college, she went to Argentina for a summer. I took each of our kids overseas for someplace I was speaking at some time in their life. And it, all but Chris, he didn't want to do that, but now he's game for that. And... Um, so she ended up going to graduate school in Boston. When she got out, she came to D.C. We were there. We were in D.C. from 1993 to 2008. And she lived with us. And it's fun to have an adult child live with you, especially when they have money and can take you to dinner. And so she, she worked as, a, uh, as an office coordinator for a, for a powerful congressman. And the person who hired her was the chief of staff, Charlie White. And Charlie was a retired naval sub-captain, submarine captain. And he was like an uncle to the team because Capitol Hill is populated by hundreds, perhaps thousands of 20-something, the best and the brightest. Many of them will come and work for free for six months or a year just to get a chance to be at the place where the power is and how all these things are supposed to work and all of that. And so she was in his... Now, Charlie was this ramrod straight guy who'd been a sub-captain for all of his career, but for the last 16 years, he was chief of staff to the congressman, and chiefs of staff run Capitol Hill because they run the calendar. And if you don't get past the chief of staff, you don't get to the congressman or the senator. You just don't. And Charlie loved the congressman. The congressman was one of these Jesus followers. Congressman was this person who had a huge heart for human rights and religious freedoms and he would travel on his vacations and recesses would travel to the world and go to the hard places he'd go to the sudans and the somalias and the mongolias and places where bombs were dropping and bullets were flying and charlie would go with him and they'd video some stuff and bring it back and try to get our government to be uh, engaged or aware even even though we might not have national interests connected with it and Charlie loved the congressman and his courage and his faithfulness and stuff. He just didn't buy the Jesus part. He just didn't. And one day they were in Sierra Leone visiting a refugee camp because there the rebels would come into town and would intimidate the villagers. And they'd intimidate them this way. They'd put a box out there and write some stuff on pieces of paper and then they'd have people go get the paper out and it would say a part of their body, a foot, a hand, an arm, and whatever that was, they would chop off. So there were camps full of young moms with no hands. I mean, it was horrific, demonic, if you will. And Charlie was there, and he, and he was filming this, and he got a pain in his hip. And they went back, and he went to Johns Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore, and they said, you have a virulent form of cancer. We don't know if we can stop it, but what we... What we can do is we can replace your hip and see if that'll do it. So Charlie was at home waiting to have his hip replaced in a few days. Jenny had been four years in that office, and she wanted to do the missions thing again, a different kind of mission than Capitol Hill. Both those are missions. And so she was with this group called World Vision, and she was going to Mauritania, West Africa, one of my air maps. If this is the hump of Africa, Mauritania is over here. It's, it's, it's like the end of the earth in terms of desert and all that. 
And before she flew out on a Monday, she said, I want to go see Charlie. So in a snowstorm, we drove from D.C. out to Vienna, Virginia, 20 miles away. We walked in, and Charlie was there. And when we, we were just going to stay 15 minutes, and Jenny was going to thank him. And we stayed two hours because Charlie wanted to talk about God. So at the end, we just had a little prayer, and we left. I said, Charlie, could I come see you like on Friday? He said, Absolutely. We left. The next day, we put Jenny on Flight 28, Air France to Paris and on to Nouakchott, Mauritania. And on Friday, I went back to see Charlie. And when I walked in, first thing Charlie said to me was, Dick, I don't think I can do this without God. I said, okay. He said, so what do I do? I said, well, why don't you give your whole life to him? He said, okay, I just have one question. I said, what's that? He said, I haven't paid any attention to God for 64 years. If I come to him now, when I could be checking out, as he put it, isn't he going to be mad? I said, Charlie, you have adult children? He said, yeah. I said, what if you had an adult child who was estranged from you, and he or she called up and said, Dad, I really screwed stuff up. I really messed up, and I just... I just uh, I just like to come home. I just like to sit in front of the TV, eat pizza, watch some movies, just catch up on what I've missed and get to know you. I said, how would you feel about that? He said, I'd be thrilled about that. I said, well, if you as a, as a faulty earthly father feel that way, how much more would a perfect heavenly father who loves you the most like that, right? And he said, okay, so what do I do? I said, well, why don't we pray he said well like how do you do that because <laughs> if you've not done that you don't know the protocol right I said well it's just like talking would Charlie would you like me to help you with that he said yeah I said so I'm, I'm gonna say a phrase or a sentence and then you just follow me out loud he said okay so here we are sitting in his front room both with this former Navy sub captain I said dear God this is Charlie he said dear God this is Charlie and I'm just getting ready to say the second phrase, and Charlie just takes off. And he just says, well, God, I've screwed everything up for a lot of years, and I'm just here to tell you that I really need you. And, I would, and he just poured his guts out on the coffee table like for 90 seconds, and it threw me off because I had a good prayer ready to go. And, 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 when I, and then suddenly he stopped. He was done, and he sat back, and he didn't, like he didn't even say Amen. And we all know it doesn't work if you don't say amen. <laughs> and then he looked at me and said, so now what? And all of a sudden, he was the sub-captain ready for the mission. I said, you know, your wife has prayed for you for a lot of years. Flight attendant with United flew every week to Europe, first class, and all that lovely lady named Mary. I said, why don't you tell Mary what you've done? He said, Mary, come in here. Mary came in. He said, Mary, I have just given my whole life to God through Jesus Christ. I have embraced him fully and willingly under no stress or duress from Dick. <laughs> I think the angels cheered. And so we started going to see Charlie every week and my young aide, a young man, 21 years old, just out of college by the name of Joel Schmidgall. Some of you know Joel. Joel drove this old car that he got from his dad who got it from a limo owner. He got 350,000 miles on a town and country Lincoln that was all over the road. We called it Waltzing Matilda. He would pick her up, pick him up in that and take him to his radiation and take him to his chemo. And it became clear, even though we were praying for healing for Charlie, it became clear that, that he was racing for the finish line. And one day I walked in, he said, Dick, you know how, how you said that if I started following Jesus, I'd see, different with, see people with different eyes? I said, yeah. He said, I think I'm starting to see that. I said, what do you mean? He said, I woke up this morning, I looked at Mary, and, and you know she's a beautiful woman. I said, I know that. He said, but it was like I was looking at the Mona Lisa for the first time. I said, did you happen to mention that to Mary? He said, no. He said, Mary, come in here. <laughs> Mary liked that Mona Lisa thing. One day I walked in and I said, he said to me, Dick, I don't know if I have enough faith. I said, how much do you need? He said, I don't know how much I need. I said, well, how much does Jesus say you need? 
He said, Dick, I don't know how much Jesus says I need. I said, well, he says you need faith the size of Middle Eastern mustard seed, which is like fine pepper, just a teens. That's all you need. I said, Charlie, you're sitting on the ottoman. You got a new hip. You're sitting there. Can you put any more weight on that chair? You're sitting on this chair with your leg up on the ottoman. Can you put any more weight on that chair than you're you're doing right now? He said, no. I said, that's how Jesus wants you to trust him. Just put all your weight on him. He said, oh, okay. Shortest conversation I've ever had on faith. I walked out the door. I said, God, what's going on here? And God said, Foth, Charlie is a child. And he's going to believe whatever you tell him. So you better get it right. And Charlie would grow and we took him some songs on CDs back in the day and and Joel would take him to his doctor's appointment. They loved Joel so much they wanted to adopt him by the time Charlie went home. And it became clear that Charlie was going to slip away in a few days and I called the congressman and said, Frank, uh, I think we need to see Charlie on Saturday. So Frank came and we walked in and Charlie was in hospice care by then. And we had a room right off the entryway. And we walked in and here was Charlie, the strapping sub-captain who was now skeletal. His body was shot, but his spirit was more alive than it had ever been. And we walked in and Charlie grinned and said, hi, fellas. Then he looked at me and said, Dick, what does it mean to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Like, how how does that work? I said, Charlie, I, I don't know. I, like I haven't done that part yet. I don't know. But if it's like everything else I've done in following Jesus, whatever he tells me to do when I do that, it, it seems to work. So I think it means to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, you come to me for counsel. It's very deep, you know. It, <laughs> and the congressman said, well, Dick, we're... Where's that part where Jesus is preparing a room and he's going to come get us? I said, that's John 14. He said, find that place and, you know, find it, read it to us, tell us what it means. I said, yes, sir. And it says, Jesus says, I'm going to go and prepare a room, add a room on the old Middle Eastern compound. Husband goes to find a wife, brings her back, they add on her room. And that's sort of the image of heaven in the story. And he's there and we're with him. I said, Charlie, I think, I think Jesus is going to come get you in a few days and take him there. And Charlie said, I think so too. And I said, and Lord willing, you're going to turn around a couple of times and Frank and I will show up. He said, that's great. I, um, I said, why don't we have a prayer, Charlie? So I called Mary in. We joined hands around Charlie's bed. And I said, Congressman, why don't you? This man had a brother in Charlie. They traveled the world for 16 years in horrific, hellish places. They were like this. He got about three sentences out. He couldn't talk. So I finished the prayer. And we said, Charlie, we'll see you soon. We turned to walk out. And as we turned to walk out, he called out and said, I love you guys. It's the last thing we heard Charlie say. A couple weeks later, we're standing at the graveside at Arlington National Cemetery. They've had the whole thing, the case on with the horses and the flag covered. And they fold up the flag and the officer kneels in front of Mary and says, from the heart of a grateful nation. And the, and the bugler starts playing taps down at the tree line. And I had this flash because not long before that, I had been, Ruth and I had been invited to a friend's commissioning ceremony. It was change of command. Our friend Vern Clark, who's a pastor's kid, had become a four-star admiral. And he had been commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet. And then the president said, we'd like you to run the whole Navy. So Ruth and I went down sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise in Norfolk Harbor, hundreds of people, and the Navy has this thing. And I told Charlie I was going, and he said, he said you're going to love that. Just because, you're going to love it. And the Navy has this thing where when they announce people arriving, they do not, um, 
they don't name the person. They just say Atlantic Second Fleet arriving and the Admiral from the Second Fleet. And then they said U.S. Navy arriving and Richard Danzig, the Secretary of the Navy, stepped up. And that's how they, and so it's permission to board and they announced the, so-and-so arriving. And I had a flash of recognition sitting on the deck of the Enterprise that, that that's how it was when Jesus came as a baby to Bethlehem. The announcement was kingdom of God arriving. So I'm standing at Arlington Cemetery, the bugler starts playing, and I have this other flash that I believe, I just choose to believe this, that when Charlie showed up in heaven, I don't know if they have loudspeakers in heaven, I don't know, but I could hear them saying, attention all hands, United States Navy captain retired, Charles Evans Hughes White, child of God, arriving. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you arrived so that we can arrive. Thank you, Father, that you became a child so we could become and all of our lives stay children at heart and walk in humility and spontaneity, walk with our lives being an ongoing series of firsts because we're always moving to new places or deeper or broader. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege and the infusion of your spirit to do that. And I pray if there was anyone in the sound of my voice that's a Charlie, not believing for years and years and years, but perhaps seeing in somebody with whom you're close the childlike spirit of God at work and you're drawn to that this day, I challenge you in this prayer to take the step because he's the father who wants to welcome you home. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a new city, for new people, for new kids, because that's who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. <laughs>